Hey there, I thought I would make a video showing some of the changes I've made to my single-handed controller project. Basically trying to speed a few things up with custom circuit boards so I can avoid raising the price since everything is up in price. Uh, yeah, so let's get started. Um, I've already detached the faceplate, so I'm going to make some marks with the laser on this so I'll know where the parts go. This is a right-handed controller, which means I don't have to move the face buttons. And to be completely, blatantly transparent, it probably takes about a half hour less to make the controller with the buttons on the right, but I charge the same for both. Okay, I got the laser marking from the laser, so I'm going to drill two two millimeter holes. So even though I'm an American, for whatever reason, I use all metric when I build these. At least by drill bits. Oh yeah, because you know what I'm going to put into that two millimeter hole? An English size 256 screw. Oh! Oh, the, the horror, the humanity. Dogs and cats living together. This is what I used to use for the D-pad. I was getting these from a place, but then they got too expensive. So then I had Osh Park make me a big grid. Uh, sawing it apart by hand isn't a big deal because it uses the, the bandsaw, but the problem is these particular switches, while nice, most of the pad is under the switch, so it's very difficult to solder by hand and there's a lot of like errors, like you think it's soldered but it's not. Ah, oh, here we go. D-pad 2021. So I got these made and these use a different type of tech switch, specifically these really small guys. I picked these because they're quite flat, which means I can make the deep, the entire D-pad assembly itself flatter and closer to the controller. Also, this should be easier to solder. I mean, obviously I've already done this before, but as you see the, um, the pins, they're rather exposed. You can, you know, you can see the edge of the pin. The only thing I'd be worried about with these is it's, I mean, since this is, this is like, just like the essence of a tack switch, it's very bare bones. Might be a little concerned about flux getting in there and fluxing up the joint like a fracking Cylon. Man, that was such a good show. I heard they're trying to make it into a movie for some reason. So even though these aren't the easiest thing to solder either, um, it's more obvious that they are connected. And which is good because sometimes I would build one of these controllers and I would go to test it and then one of the buttons wouldn't be working or it'd be stuck on. And I would make a lot of those in my reflow oven, but still there can be errors underneath the switch. Some solder got into the uh, vias, but we can just suck that out with some wick. As Shania Twain would say, it's holding on to solder to save my life. <gasps> That's it, Shania Twain. You have crossed the Rubicon of singing, Ben. I think I've mentioned this before in videos, but yeah, I, I went like 10 years without watching television. Probably from like when I graduated high school up until like the mid 2000s. Then I got like hooked on like History Channel and World War II stuff. When Shania Twain was a big thing, I was like, what is the big deal, right? And then I, then then like when YouTube came along, and then, like, you know, I saw her music videos, and I'm like, oh, I get it now. I mean, it should have been obvious, but... <sighs> I don't know. It also took me, I guess, what, about 40 years to realize the Milwaukee Brewers logo is a M and a B shaped like a ball glove. I always just thought it looked like a ball glove. I couldn't see the forest for the trees. Why does every singer come from Canada? Is there something about Canada that makes people want to sing? Maybe they sing to keep warm. It's like, oh, hey, it's so cold up here, you know. We gotta sing to keep warm. All right, Neil Young, you, uh, you go take that, uh, you go take the dining room. Shania Twain, you're gonna go warm up the kitchen. Alanis Morissette, we're gonna need you in the pantry. And uh, Brian Adams, he can go to the living room. Okay, everyone, go warm up Canada. Oh, man, there's way more Canadian singers than that. Those are just ones I could think of off the top of my head. Oh, Canada. Now here's the new base 
um, the old one looked like this. Had some walls to it. This one's a little flatter, just so it has a lower profile. Um, yeah, so I'm going to use Tester's Model Glue. Da, 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 da. Okay, Model Glue from plastic to PCB. On paper, it shouldn't work that great, but it actually works. This should lock in pretty tight because of the features around it. And also, you can see there's a hole in the middle. All right, I'll compress this and then I'll attach it to the controller. Didn't Neil Young make like some sort of MP3 player, like Sonos or something? And it kind of looked like a, a rectangular Pringles can. I think the gag was that with that was that it was like all the music was really high bit rate, you know, as if no other player could do that, right? Maybe it had like a good sound chip in it. Because I'm sure uh, Neil Young is an expert engineer. Well, obviously he would know a lot about sound. He'd be like, oh, I'm going to get, wait, he's not British. <laughs> He'd be like, yeah, hey, uh, I'd like to make this MP3 player, you know, but I'm going to need like the bestest, most chooching chip I can get for it to make her go, you know. Now, one of the issues with these really flat tacks, which is, is you can't just put a flat D-pad on it because it wouldn't be able to actuate anything. So I made a new kind of D-pad. Unfortunately, it kind of looks like the Walmart logo. Maybe I'm subconsciously a Walmart lover. So see this little interstitial piece? This goes down first, and then this actually has little, kind of little nubs that will actually push the buttons. My cat likes to jump up on my nightstand and walk around on the clock, like literally pushing my buttons, and then the clock will get programmed to like some weird nap or the alarm will change. So I'm like, bud, you are literally pushing my buttons. Same thing with the Roomba. I mean, first I'm like, oh, the Roomba, since Bud is never going to get a feline sibling, his only choice chance might be of dog sibling. But even that, I'm kind of thinking no. So I'll get him a Roomba sibling. So yeah, when Bud's being whiny, I'll just push a button and turn on the Roomba, and that will distract him. Well... It took Bud about one week to figure out how to turn on the Roomba himself, and now he loves to do it. <sighs> and of course, Bud doesn't understand batteries or chemicals or compositions because he's a primitive Neanderthal. So the he'll start the Roomba, it'll clean, it'll go home. Then he'll start it again, and then it'll die because it doesn't get back to the battery charger in time. These are just uh, surface mount tack switches, and I just glue them in place. Like when I first made this style controller, I really thought these two switches were going to be the biggest point of failure, but uh, no, the biggest point of failure, well, they do fail, but they're probably third, the big, so the biggest point of failure is dun dun dun, analog stick drift, which isn't my fault, then uh, it's D-pad and then those. Here's a tiny little plug. Happy little clouds. So this goes into the bottom. See how it's, I don't know if you can see it on camera, but it's a little bit lower than the nubs uh, it, because it pushes up to the PCB. That's why there's a slight gap difference. The D-pad rotates on the axes of the center point. And then you put this in place. And then this is the part I don't like. I have to glue it together. But I can't print it like this because it's got two facing surfaces. I guess maybe I could like, maybe get like, do a Shapeways order, like, you know, get some house to print this with like a powder printer. Or I could just, you know, get better at assembling them. Get good. Speaking of singers, uh, Allison and I had this idea for a, a Weird Al Yankovic parody of a Mariah Carey song. And it was gonna be, the premise was Mariah Carey was gonna be dating a photographer and the entire video was going to take place in the developing room. Of course, nowadays, people wouldn't understand that. But in 1990, they would have. 
Anyway, the song was gonna be, you've got me feeling emulsion, do 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 li, deeper than I ever had before, do 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 li. And then the whole thing would be like, you know, in the red hues of the developing room. And then she'd be like, oh. That was before auto-tune. Mariah Carey just, could, just, she could just do it. All right, so here's the new cap. It's got like the teardrop shape. It's one of those things where it's like, I wanted the four cardinal directions of the D-pad to look more distinct. That's why I separated them in the design. And then I'm like, oh no, it's the Walmart logo. Now that I've said that, you can never unsee it. What can I say except you're welcome? You've got me feeling emotion higher than I ever before. Do, 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 do. Nowadays, kids would be like, what's emotion? Is that in Fortnite? Blah. <laughs> I'm a Zoomer. <laughs> Apparently, Zoomers talk like Valley Girls from the 80s. <laughs> That's why they should have made a Back to the Future remake. I know, sacrilege, but can you imagine a teen today if they went back to like 1985 and were trying to fix their parents, they wouldn't know what the heck to do. They would be a fish out of water. Okay, let's 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 talk turkey. Like, oh my, you can't remake Back to the Future. It's like Back to the Future would be a better movie to remake than most of the movies that get remade because Back to the Future is like a theme that became more relevant with time. Gen Xers and Boomers are way more similar than even Gen Xers and Millennials to say nothing for um, Zoomers. Let's think about it, 1985, 1955. Hmm, I wanna hang out with my friends. How do I do it in 1985? Beep, 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 ring, ring. Oh, it's a, it's a touch tone phone instead of a rotary dial, big whoop. Hello? Hi, mom of my friend. Is my friend there? Hold on. Hey, friend of Ben. Ben's on the phone. Now we're gonna go watch Jackie Gleason. In the 1950s, it was the same thing. There were no different means of communications for the average person. Yes, in 1985, email existed, cell phones existed, but nobody used it. How did you get your information in 1985? From a newspaper or a TV? How'd you get your information in 1955? From a newspaper or TV? People had computers, obviously that was, you know, computers in the home was a big difference. Radar ranges. Again, we're talking about a movie where a teenager is trying to fix his parents. Those things really wouldn't have any effect on the story. In fact, I think you could make the character development even better. It's like a major flaw with the original Back to the Future is that Marty has no character development. That's why in the sequels, they give him that quote unquote arc where, you know, people call him scared or yellow. And he's like, nobody calls me chicken needles, nobody. Because they're like, oh, our main character has no development. All right, let's desolder the rumble motors. You know, in the Xbox 360, these rumble motors had plugs disconnecting them, but I guess it was cheaper to pay someone in China to solder them in place than the cost of the plug. Plugs are actually one of the most expensive things in any device. They're very expensive. In the back, I think it's probably a little too late to make a Back to the Future sequel. They should have did it like four or five years ago. I mean, hell, you could even reuse the Reagan joke. Could have. Uh, but so let's say it's present day and you have Marty and who knows, maybe Marty's even a woman. Does, doesn't really matter. Well, first of all, don't start the movie with Marty with a girlfriend. You know, like, I got a girlfriend, she's beautiful, Jennifer. She changes in the second movie, but have it be like, Marty's at school, and there's a girl he likes. Okay, I guess Marty's a guy now. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, because the sexuality of Marty isn't... Well, actually, no, it did matter, because... His mom falls in love with him. Oh, no, you'd have to keep it as Marty because if a woman went back in time and the future father fell in love with her, that would be gross. But it's completely okay when it's, <laughs> when it's the mom. Okay, so Marty's at school, right? And there's this girl he likes and he like looks at her down the hallway and he, uh, he like texts her or pings her on Insta but she doesn't respond. And I, th I think I just described like 20 scenes from Rick and Morty. So then anyway, 
Marty goes back in time and fixes his parents, and he learns about he learns more about human communication by being in the past. Marty comes back to the future, and he goes into the school, and he looks at all the students, and everyone has got their head down over their phone, and he walks through the school. It's like he's he's been awoken. He's like, I can see the Matrix, right? And then he walks right up to the girl that he likes, and he's like, hi, and he asks her out on a date, which also happens to Rick and Morty. You know, right there is something really easy you could do. You can make a commentary on, like, modern phone culture and be like, hey, you know what? In the past, we, uh, we communicated better as people. Marty gets an arc along with his parents. So what I did with this one was I drilled some holes so the wires can pass through when the time comes. I need to let this glue dry a little bit more, although it's probably okay. Actually, while that, while that dries, I will remove the analog stick. So this is gonna be a right-handed controller, which means this analog stick needs to be removed and moved to the right. And then we also need to remove the Hall effect sensor. So how these work is the triggers move a magnet to and fro and the sensor detects the proximity or strength of the magnetic field and that's where the analog value comes from. So the first controller to do that was the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast had Hall effect sensors for both of the analog triggers and the joystick. <laughs> yeah, so there was, uh, I believe they had four Hall effect sensors on the PCB and joystick, the analog stick just had a magnet in it. So the four sensors could determine its position. Now the PlayStation 3 also used Hall effect sensors. The analog sticks looked pretty much the same except for the side where the, um, where the, this is a carbon film potentiometer, the, where that was, it was a little integrated circuit with I believe four wires going to it. So it was actually a Hall effect sensor. So it was much, 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 much less likely to break. So if you've got like a fighter jet or something and there's like buttons and switches in it, they use Hall effect sensors because it's technically not a mechanical switch. Just a magnet moving back and forth, which makes it more reliable. Sony in the past had done something about analog stick drift. But then, as so, as so often the case, well, Hall effect sensors are expensive, especially <laughs> right now. Xbox uses Allegro's. Don't quote me on that. I know you can replace them with Allegro's. Like, Allegro's are really hard to find because they don't have a fab. Switching on the Heiko desoldering gun. Actually, speaking of which... Okay, this next part was sponsored by PCB Way. Go to PCB Way to have all of your PCBs made in a great way. Wow, Ben, you're like the last person to do a PCB Way video. Eh, whatever. So, this is what I had made. Flexible circuits. Let's take a look at one. See that? In the past, I would buy through-hole Hall effect sensors. Let me grab an example. Um, like these, right? They're expensive, and also uh, through-hole. You know, through-hole is obsolete. So a lot of through-hole stuff you can't even get anymore. So I was having trouble finding through-hole stuff, and now you just have trouble finding the sensors. So I designed this. It is a flex circuit board that allows you to repurpose a surface mount sensor in uh, You basically can mount it like a through hole sensor. Why did I put solder on that side? So I call this my Hall effect sensor recycler. Yes, I know it has a certain anatomical look, but hey, you know what? Some shapes just suit the purpose through evolution or God or whatever you want to believe in. Evolution is pretty hard to deny. I mean, that doesn't mean there can't be some sort of flying spaghetti monster, because, you know, it probably is. It's a big universe. <sighs> like, you can go to, uh... A perfect example is, uh... If you've ever been in New York City, um, their... Their subway system is... Ancient. Oh, so I'm using the Heiko FR301. It's got like a cartridge. It's pretty cool. It's a standalone desoldering gun, so I don't need like a whole station for it. Anyway, 
But so much of it's just so old and so ingrained, it's like kind of difficult to fix. So there are portions of the subway system that built over a hundred years ago and, and humans just keep evolving to be larger. I mean, this has been happening, you know, for as long as there's been humans, but you can even see it like in the span of a hundred years, like I'm like five, nine, I'm like, I'm like New York tall, but I'm Midwest short. You go, some of those subways, the ceiling, the ceilings are really low. They're like lower than like an old basement. It's like, I could easily reach up and touch the ceiling. No, no problem whatsoever. Like, like if you were like an NBA player, you wouldn't fit in there. I mean, seriously, there might be like six foot five clearance. But you think when they were made, people were shorter. Really amazing place. It's like my, that's my favorite major US city by a long shot. Okay, now I'm gonna use this thin wire to butt up right next to the switches. So I used to uh, scavenge this, I think it's like 28 gauge solid strand ribbon cable. I used to scavenge it from uh, hard drive cables, but again, no one's used those kind of cables in like at least 15 years. So now I have to basically just buy this cable new. It's like, it's not so much that it isn't green. It's like, oh man, I used to get this for free and I have to pay for it. I'm gonna cover this with a uh, hot glue and foam, but I'm gonna make sure that the connections are right. Notice how I'm going to the opposite side of the switch. That ensures that the signal is going all the way through the switch because you could touch this part of it and that doesn't necessarily mean that the connection is good. It just means that you're touching the wire. That one moved a little bit, but that's okay because we're about to arrest its development. These buttons replace left bumper and L3. Once my spit dries. Wow, Ben, you really put your blood, sweat, and tears into this. Yes, except for the tears part. I don't think I've ever had one of these controllers make me cry. Although sometimes, yeah, the D-pad would be kind of finicky and I'd be like, oh, I wasted 45 minutes on that D-pad. Kind of makes me want to cry. So make no mistake, I charge people for these controllers. I do it at half my normal rate. That's as charitable as I can get. Like 2020? I guess because people were stuck at home playing video games. I think I sold more of these in 2020 than I ever did. I went like, oh like hundred. I did like 126 of these last year. I basically, I always just mark the rightmost wire with a color. I'm gonna. I'm gonna take this. I'm gonna bend it a little bit. You'll see why in a, in a bit. I'm gonna put that over there. All right. Let's back up the camera. Okay, so with this one, there's a handy slit there. Thanks, Microsoft. I don't even know why that's there. Maybe it's there for me. All right, so obviously there's going to be the right analog stick here, so we have to avoid that. Oh, don't worry. There's more PCBs coming. Also, what is it, December 3rd now? Yes. I have decided that this month in December, I am going to... Well, I mean, I still got things like this going on, but and then we got then we got like a batch of boards going to spooky. Anyway, I should have more free time this December than I have in a good number of months. So, what I was thinking about doing is like app, like kind of taking it easy, because you know I am self-employed, but I mean I still I don't didn't completely re completely retire. I just work less than I used to. But this month I was thinking about working even less. Like at most, maybe per day I'll make one of these controllers. So then the rest of the time I can use to get caught up on other things, like rearranging my basement and also projects and videos because I know I haven't made as many videos lately or as uh, substantial. You know, this video isn't as interesting as like, oh, Ben fixes a rare whatchamathinger. Although I do have people that want to send me more rare things to fix, but I just, you know, I had to get through my other projects first. I'm hoping to actually have more time to do that because I'm getting close on my Arduboy game project. So I'll have a video about that coming up probably in a week or so. And there's some other stuff I wanted to work on. I was going to do, I started on it, um, like 
the last microcontroller, kind of like a Mad Max kind of apocalypse thing. Where the apocalypse is now. I went on DigiKey. Actually, it kind of reminded me of uh, the Dave Jones video recently where he did like jelly bean components. Um, it was a similar kind of thing where I went on DigiKey and I was like, I was trying to find what is the most plentiful microcontroller right now, or I should say like a Cortex, uh, ARM Cortex M0. And I found one, it was like a dinky little SAM D11C. So it's like this 14 pin chip with the USB. So it was like, what the heck would you do with this? Which is probably why they had so many of them in stock. All right, so this is one of the trickier soldering parts. Remember when I was talking about connectors? See this connector right here? That obviously connects the two halves of the boards together. But the original <clears throat> launch, the launch model of the Xbox One controller, there was two of those connectors. And it passed all the buttons through one to one. Now, if you look over here, here where I'm soldering. Now, thankfully, there's test points for everything, which I've already obviously um, discovered and memorized. I'm going to get myself a ground reference here. But what is this little chip right there? Well, that is an NXP I squared C serial I.O. expander. So for those of you who don't know, that is a device where you can have, I believe, up to 16 I.O. inputs. The device will store them in their own internal memory, and then a microcontroller can pull that device using the I squared C format, which only takes two lines. And then the device will say, okay, it'll send back two bytes, which is the status of its 16 IO. So Microsoft added that integrated circuit so they could remove a connector. If you want to get really pedantic about it, that means the buttons which are attached to this chip that come over a serial bus, which would be pretty much everything except for the B button. Um, you probably get them, well, They'd be collected and then they would, everything would be sent over as a frame, right? But if you were trying to run this thing as fast as possible, that would create a lag bottleneck. I mean, a, a pretty imperceivable one in the grand scheme of things compared to like a game engine speed, but still. So this is why you had to pay me to do this because I do a lot of fairly intricate soldering. Now, feel free to copy what I'm doing here off the screen and steal work from me. I mean, I hope you have a steady hand. I like a man with a slow touch. Is that how that goes? All I want to do is make love to you. Yeah. Well, at least he's not singing Kenny Rogers again. Or Kenny Loggins. How much you want to bet Kenny Loggins is from Canada? Kenny Loggins was born in Everett, Washington in 1948. He was not born in Canada, but he was born in Washington, which is close. That's close to Canada, just like where I live in Wisconsin. Do I sound Canadian? Some people say I sound Canadian. And Watergate does not bother me. So you have to use the memory of the wire. So I'll take the wire, move it further than it needs to go and see how the wire is angled down. So when, when I touch it, that way I know the tip of the wire is pointing right down into the solder blob, which helps me get a good connection. So you've probably heard me say a million times that knowing how solder flows and reacts is the most, or one of the most important things about soldering. It's the same thing with wires, like understanding, not, not just understanding, because obviously the actual metallurgy of it is beyond my comprehension. Oh, that's kind of painful. So you also pay me to uh, do that. Look, Ben, your fingerprints are all over this. Oh, you mean it's a design that was clearly made by Ben? No, I mean his fingerprints are literally in the hot glue inside the project. So see if you wanted to like break into my cell phone. Oh yeah, that could be that could be a hacker movie. It's like Angelina Jolie would like take something that I built and then get my fingerprint out of the hot glue. Actually, that would probably work. Maybe I shouldn't give people ideas. We're gonna go on your phone and swipe right on everyone no now we've got these three wires coming from the face buttons i'm going to separate the one on my left because that's l3 the 
analog click in. Obviously that attaches to the board with the analogs. I'm going to flatten this one out with my uh, thumbs. A little bit of hot glue. Hot glue is great. I don't know why people make fun of it. I think it was mostly Jerry Ellsworth that made fun of me for hot glue back in the day. It's one of the best inventions ever. It's like microchip, the wheel, hot glue. So the center one of these wires, which is the one on the left, is ground. So I just need to attach that to the common pole of the tack switch. So this is bringing the left bumper over to those face buttons. And since the Xbox controller is really simple, unlike the PlayStation controllers, uh, I should I should change I should preface that. It's simple compared to the PlayStation PlayStation 3 controller was like really overly ridiculously complicated. PlayStation 4 controller was less complicated. PlayStation 2 and 3, every uh, face button was analog. Like how hard you held a button made a difference. Very few games used it. I think like Madden might have and like one of the Metal Gear games. Metal Gear, yeah. Metal Gear 3 did, because like you would hold the A button, you would touch the A button to like pull your gun and then you push it all the way to shoot. Anyway, so them doing that meant that there was multiple analog voltage rails going to the buttons and it was really hard to modify, which is why you didn't really see much modified PlayStation 3 controllers stuff for me, even though it did have the the Hall effect sensors. But when they got to the PlayStation uh, 4, they removed that functionality, so the only analog button was, you know, the analog triggers. And they still do them the same way, which is a much cheaper <laughs> method than how uh, Microsoft does it here. But it also made the rest of the controller much easier to, to work on, because you basically, you now have... Well, actually, there's a few anomalies, but for the most part, it's a ground signal and then the button. And then you, you know, you close the button and the... I'm going to carefully remove this magnet. The utmost precision. Oh, no, I accidentally cut off a finger. Probably be a lot harder to cut through bone than plastic. Oh, of course it would be. Unless the bone was, like, out in the desert and all dried up. But, yeah, that's why it's like, oh... Ben doesn't make PlayStation 4 accessibility controllers. It's like, well, it's not like I didn't try. It's just all those. Well, actually, it wasn't just, okay. So once you got to PlayStation 4, it wasn't just the voltages. The whole thing, the whole face of it was a, uh, a silk screen circuit. So not like this. This is actually copper on a substrate. I mean, like pieces of plastic with conductive ink on them, like how a keyboard is made. And by and like the whole all the face buttons are like that, so to interface with it, um, some guy made these um, made these flexible PCBs like the one I just showed you. Actually, I think I have, yeah, right here. So he made these where you would put this between the flex circuit and the PCB of the PlayStation PlayStation controller, and it would basically sniff the signals and then you could solder it there. But there's Sony changes their controllers all the time. So there's also this model. There are actually I got a bag of them in my car. Lance gave them to me here in town. Um, there's actually PlayStation 4 controllers with the same the same model number, but depending on where the model number appears on the sticker on the back of the controller, they have different internals. Not kidding. It's ridiculous. Microsoft, they made there's been three whole controllers. There was the 2013 model Xbox One controller, 2016 Xbox One S Bluetooth, and then there's this core controller, which is, the core controller is almost identical to the 2016 controller, including that uh, expander chip that I told you about. That's actually, they, they started doing that in 2016. The only thing different about this controller is that there's a share button. Other than that, it's identical. And fun fact, these controllers are backwards compatible, so you could actually use these on your old Xbox One. I actually still have an Xbox One. I did buy an Xbox One, no, Xbox Series X. Yeah, that's another project I've got in the works, because of course I have to make it portable. All right, so let's take a look. Not too bad. Oh, I need to put my decorative cap here. I'm going to check this, make sure everything's working before I continue. All right, everything checks out. I kind of wish the D-pad had more play to it. 
all the all the directions work so it doesn't actually move that much now that's in comparison to how it used to be before where it was way too loose so i think i might need to dial in like a happy happy medium but uh this one in this controller right now works so i think we're good all right i'm going to attach this four pin ribbon cable i'm going to attach it to the missing analog stick so we need four wires we need x y and then voltage reference and ground. So we don't need all six wires, we just need four. Now this ribbon cable is going to go to one of the new circuit boards that I made. We'll see that in the final step of this project. Now they did make a few differences with this particular revision of uh, the controller. Um, the previous version, they did not use plated through holes for these controller vias. So a plated through hole is where the, well, it's where the metal plate or, you know, the tin goes through the hole. Now before they only had, I don't know if I have an example of it, I might. They only had the tin on one side. Now there's pros and cons to that. And pro is that it's easier to solder. Con is that it's easier to damage because if you have a pad, like let's say that pad right there, right? If it's only on one side of the controller, it's only held in by the glue right there. But if it's a plated through hole, it's connected to the plating on the inside and on the other side. So it acts as kind of a pop rivet. Oh man, I had this weird dream last night about like rubber wheels, Patrick Swayze and pop rivets. <laughs> it was Patrick Swayze. I don't know why, was, that's weird. Yeah, he's like, I'll show you how to use a pop rivet. And I'm like, what the hell? Man, that was a weird dream. Let me see if I can find an example of that. This is, uh, this is the 2013 model. See where the analog stick went? See how there's no vias on this side? And they're only on this side? And then sure enough, you can see this one. When I removed it, these pads fell off because the copper is basically just glued to the FR4. So if you don't desolder it carefully, you can, you can lose it. The negative of them being through hole is that it takes more heat to desolder it because you're having to heat up everything on the entire through hole, not just one side. So it's a, it's a yin and a yang. It also makes the analog sticks a little bit more difficult to remove when you desolder them. So there's a the rear of the controller. Let me back up a bit. So this is where the new analog trigger goes. So we're gonna take this analog trigger and move it over here. And that's where our uh, flex PCB surface mount sensor comes into play. Okay, so here's the rear right trigger frame. It's 3D printed, of course. I'm gonna put it in place then use an X-Acto knife to mark the entry point for the Hall Effect sensor. Yeah, it's just easier to do it this way than to try to make some sort of jig that wouldn't be accurate anyway. Couldn't you just take the shell of a controller and put it over the other controller and then drill the hole? No, it, it wouldn't be accurate, trust me. All right, so use a little bit of hot glue to hold it in place. And then I'll put in a screw to hold it in place. So my rule with this one is I try to have at least two screws for every 3D printed part, if not three. So they have multiple contact points for the controller. So how I designed these parts was I actually went on, I think it was Turbo Squid, and I bought a 3D model of the Xbox controller. Then I put the model like in space in uh, Fusion 360, and then I designed the parts kind of right on it. Then I took it into Mesh Mixer and did a Boolean subtraction. So I took objects like this, and then I subtracted the controller from it, which created an object that had a concavity so it, it would fit up to the controller. And, Worked out pretty good. So the model, uh, while I'm here, I'm gonna drill a hole for the ribbon cable to exit. All right, now I need to find a trigger with a magnet. Actually, before I do that, let's put in the Hall Effect sensor. So, got our Hall Effect sensor on the adapter PCB from PCB Way. I'm gonna thread it through this hole here. Now we're on this side. Happy little clouds. So a YouTube video, it was about um, where did all the Bob Ross paintings go? And they're definitely someplace. They're all in like this, uh, I don't say storage facility, it's more like a, it's like a shop in a strip mall and then 
they're all held in the back, and there's like this lady that like is the conservator of them. So again, just got like some testers glue. And then I'm just gonna put a little tiny dollop of hot glue over that. Who is texting me today? Just leave me alone. So when I changed uh, sensors again, I was using, uh, where is it here? Ah oh, yes, I was using uh, six millimeter by three millimeter neodymium magnets. So if you use a three by six magnet, it's too much magnetism. So I'm using a three by three. Because if you recall, that's that, well, you probably couldn't tell. The um, magnet that I pulled out of the controller was a ceramic magnet because obviously it's cheaper. That's like your garden variety kitchen magnet. Although I don't, I don't know, I have all sorts of neodymium magnets on my refrigerator. So not only do you need a smaller magnet, so it's a much smaller magnet, but even then I have it slightly recessed. I don't know if you can see that. It's recessed by about 1.5 millimeters. Otherwise it overpowers the sensor. When it was a three by six magnet, it was positioned like this. So you'll notice I actually put the three by three magnet not in the center of where it used to be, oh crap, but on one side of it. Great, now I gotta check my polarity again. That's why I always keep one of these laying around so I get a polarity reference because it does matter. Every time you push one of these triggers, a bird loses its way to the South Pole. Wait, the South Pole? I don't think a bird would go to the South, well, I guess some birds. Well, they wouldn't go to the South Pole, they'd just be at the South Pole. Take a little bit of super glue, push down the magnet with it because this is not metal, so I can, now let's assemble the trigger. So I'm gonna take this spring, actually I need to order some more springs today for McMaster car, because right now I have no springs. Now there's a little tab there, which prevents it from springing all the way out. I used to use a half a spring to try to save money, but the full spring gives you pretty good bounce. Also, but you don't want it to be too hard to push the trigger, although this trigger is not hard to push. Um, because when people, you know, if people have a limitation with their hands, you're like, oh, we want you to do more things with one hand. So you want something to be easier to press, not harder. Um, oh, shoot, did I forget? Oh, I didn't drill the other two millimeter hole. Holding on to love to save my life. Oh yeah, this one has a little R on the circuit board. All right, I'm gonna find some thin cable. Actually, I think I have some right here that'll work. Yeah. And this wire will attach to the spot on the circuit board where the Hall effect sensor was. You know, I should have... Oh, who is texting me? Oh, Clarence Angel, I wish I didn't have any friends. All right, George, you have no friends. <sighs> why, why, I need to move this sofa. I, I gotta move this sofa. Sorry, George, you don't have any friends to help you move that sofa. Oh, no, I take back my wish, Angel. Well, George, it turned out in this small town with eight women in it, nobody wanted to marry your stunningly beautiful wife, and, well, she became a librarian. Oh, no, even worse, she wears glasses now. Oh, Mary, well, for one thing, I'm glad you exist again, but now I want to have a talk. Why, why don't you become a librarian? But, George, we have, like, ten kids. I, I don't care. You, you, should, you should become a librarian and, and help me pay for this drafty old house. Okay, I've attached the three wires from the Hall effect sensor to the original position, and I basically used the red wire to indicate where the right was. Um, so I'm going to fold this together, and then I'll test it to make sure the Hall effect sensor is working, and then I'll finish up with the rear analog stick. Since your brother died in that pond when you were both kids, he never grew up and saved an entire aircraft carrier full of airmen during World War II. Well, well, I mean, that's tragic and all, but, you know, there, there's plenty of aircraft carriers. We, we still won the war, right? Well, yes, George, we still did win the war. 
But there was a certain person on that aircraft carrier who didn't survive. Well, well, what was his name, you funny little angel? His name was John F. Kennedy. John F. who? John F. Kennedy would have become one of the greatest presidents ever. But because your brother wasn't there to save his ship, John F. Kennedy never became president. Well, that's okay, right? Someone else could become president instead, right? Well, they did, George. But then when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened, all-out worldwide thermonuclear war occurred. Oh, thermonuclear what? So now, not only is your wife an old maid who wears glasses, she now has to walk alone in a post-apocalyptic thermonuclear war wasteland. I want to live again, Clarence. I want to live again. Roar! Hey, you know you could call that version of the story? It's a wonderful half-life. Ha ha ha. I wonder how many viewers I lost on that one. Okay, so how I used to do this before was I would put potentiometers into this plastic casing and this would fit at the base of the controller, just like that. And then I would wire these potentiometers in parallel with the analog stick so you could adjust where the center point was. Like, because this is meant to sit on your leg, right? So maybe you want to adjust it based off your play style or how you sit. So I wanted to have those adjustments, but wiring that up by hand was kind of a pain. So what I did was I made some more circuit boards. All right, so this circuit board holds the potentiometers for you and it also has all the connections. So all you do is you solder it up and then you attach the four wires from the controller. And here's the great gag. It actually works in both positions. So if it's oriented like this, this is for the left. If you go like this, it's for the right. And then to select which way it is, you just fill in the two solder blobs on the side you're using. So in our case, we want it to be for the right. So you just put the analog stick in below the word right, and we solder it in place. Now if you notice, um, the up and down, that doesn't invert because it's the same either way. So those solder blobs just invert the connections going to the the X, because obviously that does change depending on how you use the circuit board. So we have our adjustment pots here. So they're going the opposite way of the analog stick. One negative with these pots is it's not obvious where the center point is, but all I do is I just, you know, plug it into the computer and then I tweak the center point once I have it all built, so not a big deal. So yeah, before I would have to put a bunch, I had to stick in the pots, glue them in place, attach a bunch of thin wires, and then tie those thin wires to the wires coming from the controller. Then I would put the uh, analog stick into just like a lame plastic piece. Then I would have to use bits of wire, you know, like my fabled wire bin, use bits of wire to actually combine the grounds and uh, voltage reference. But now it's uh, pretty easy. It's just Attach things to a circuit board. Saving myself time so I don't have to raise the price. Yeah, so when this goes in here, see those holes allow you access to the pots. And I'm sure if people aren't clean, these holes will collect a lot of grime and dirt, but you know what? Your cleanliness is your problem. So again, hot glue just to get it in position. Oh crap, I forgot to put the things on. Oops. Oh, man, I got so wrapped up in my It's a Wonderful Life fan fiction. I just forgot a simple and obvious step to the project. Okay, now that it's been positioned with hot glue, I'm going to go through one by one and drill a hole and drive a screw to hold it to the controller. And there's three screws, so we have three points, which is good because obviously this shaft you know, takes a lot of abuse. As does the analog stick, but there's nothing I can do about that. Well, actually, there is something I can do about it. I actually thought about making uh, my own Hall Effect sensor analog stick, but again, right now, it's like I need the, I need the Hall Effect sensors for... Well, I do have quite a good back supply of them, because, of course, I saved all the ones I removed from the controllers over the years, so I have a few hundred. Yeah, I actually thought about, yeah, do, basically ripping off the Dreamcast, making a little circuit board, having four Hall Effect sensors, having a joystick with a magnet on it. That's actually the hardest part to build mechanically. And then I was going to use a little microcontroller, and it was going to read the analog signals coming from the Hall Effect sensors. And then um, the microcontroller I was thinking about using actually has a DAC. So the microcontroller could read an analog signal, 
retranslate it and then create its own analog output that will go back to the controller. But it's like, oh, so I'm gonna use four Hall Effect sensors and two microcontrollers in 2021 to duplicate something that can be done by two carbon pots. So I was like, eh, it's a bit sketch magetch or sus, as they would say on Reddit. How are you doing, fellow kids? My skateboard over my shoulder. So this shaft, I had it a little shorter, but then I bumped it up by about 0.42 inches. So the idea is that also your hand, see, your fingers hold it, so it gives you a better grip. The ground goes to the red mark, so... I mean, I guess I could cram this wire up inside, but... I'll just put that wire over there, save it for something else. Overhead puke cam! Just like that Steam Deck. Hey, you all enjoying your Steam Decks? Oh, that's right, it's still delayed! You know, I don't think it was just battery life that helped the Game Boy beat the Game Gear. Even though the Game Gear actually did pretty well. Game Gear was also, it didn't fit in your pocket! Whereas the Game Boy, yeah, it's big, but especially you got like some nice baggy MC Hammer pants. Or what do they call them? Parachute pants? I don't think I ever... Wait, no, I think I did have a pair of parachute pants. <laughs> oh, that's, that's embarrassing. Yeah, I did! Anyway, easily fit your Game Boy brick into one of those. Oh yeah, I should show that Game Boy that I managed to get working 20 minutes after I finished the episode based off a suggestion in the comments. It was the Fuse! Alright, so this goes right into the piece. I don't know if you can see it there, but I've got a uh, pretty aggressive fillet. But I wanted to make sure... I, I did that so that the cleanup of the part would be easier. And then... Oh, I think I actually have a new... A new version of this. Ah, yes I do. So this is the old version. This version is a little bit more aggressive, so you can only put it on one way. So you've got the slits here in the side for the screws, and then um, this portion butts up against the analog stick, and that portion butts up against the tack switch. And the reason I did that is because there's a pretty good, I don't know if you can see it on camera, I say that a lot, don't I? There's a pretty, there's a huge uh, chamfer that goes all the way down. And I did that so it's easier to print the part with less overhangs, or less support, I should say. But the negative of that was this PCB would move around and like up and down a little bit. So I made this part more aggressive to lock it in place. And I suppose they're going to want an analog stick with this. So I better include that while, the, while I have time. So this goes on like this. Come on, there we go. Now it's held in place securely. Now I just put in these two screws and we are done, son. This outer hole, since threads in it don't make a difference, I should enlarge that outer hole just a little bit. Again, just to save myself whatever time I can. I'm sorry. Before these times, I was able to easily find Xbox controllers on Amazon. Plenty of stock and then I want to say they were I don't know, usually like 50 bucks. Now they're like 60. The stock is kind of nebulous. Actually, it's easier to find them at Best Buy than Amazon at the moment. And then sometimes, depending, it's so dumb. Like the black ones will be like 60 and then Best Buy will want 65 for the white ones. It's really annoying. So I'm basically trying to save time so I don't have to increase the cost. But yeah, uh, I've slowed down a little bit by documenting it, but I did that in uh, about two hours. Not too bad. Oh, also, I was able to get the Game Boy working. As someone in the comments said, it was a bad fuse. So I just uh, solder blob the fuse short for now. I have one coming in a future order, but uh, as you can see, uh, it works. Yeah, here is um, Quicks. Great game. Get that quicks. I'm gonna banish this quicks to the world of Pagan. Life hack.
Whoa! That was close. Well, anyway, I just thought I'd show you some improvements I made with the Xbox single-headed controllers, basically making it faster for me to build so I don't have to raise the price. I guess we'll see you in a future video. I'm going to try to make more videos this month. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned.